This is lesson six, and it's about Plato. Who, Plato was the student of who? Socrates is the correct answer. We're gonna start with this symposium, which is a dialogue about love that um, Plato wrote. And it's one of his more famous dialogues because love is something that um, interests everybody who's human. And we're gonna start with this idea of soulmates. You probably heard the expression, uh, so-and-so was somebody's soulmate, especially in love movies and love stories. And I think probably everyone noticed the interesting thing here is that humans used to have a different shape. And what different, what shape did they, he say that we used to be? sort of rolled around like hula hoops, you know, or, or whatever you had these. So it's just a little bizarre, right? Um, so then on the next page, um, Zeus got angry at the humans. So he decided that he's gonna do what? Split them in half, right? So instead of rolling around, they'll walk up around upright on two legs. And then Apollo twisted our heads around and smoothed out most of the wrinkles using a tool like the one the shoemakers used to work leather. Now, I thought that was an interesting detail that he, it's like a shoemaker's leather working tool, which I think makes it a little more convincing, not that you believe it happened, but it's an interesting detail to throw in. So that's a pretty famous idea and, and can you, Think of any time where you, each one of you and me would have been totally integrated with another person sometime in our life before we were born, your mommy, right? So you and her were the same person in a certain sense, right? And then you got split up. Before that, when she ate something, you ate the same thing she ate, right? And although you had your own separate beating heart, you were pretty integrated with another person. And then you were born, right? And so people have a natural desire to reintegrate with that sense of being totally linked with another person. So in my opinion, this is why people find this a powerful myth, uh, this idea that we were split in half and then finding our soulmate, because something about that feels real to us. And I think what feels real about it is, way, way deep, deep back in our soul in a way we can't even really remember. We, we you did used to be part of somebody else, right? And we are looking for that total unconditional love and completion that we at one time felt before we were spit out in the world and the doctor spanked us and we started crying and then they shoved a bottle in our face and we we're trying to figure out what's going on, right? So um, Right after that, it says, it's impossible to describe the affection the two halves feel for each other. It's hardly an exaggeration to say that they don't want to spend even a moment apart. And that's what people feel when they're super in love or they're super infatuated and thinking about the other person all the time. Um, so this myth is an attempt to explain that. So this is a very famous idea, the idea of platonic love. If you ever see a movie called Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise about a sports agent, at one point he says to the woman, you complete me, right? That's a totally uh, platonic idea. It's a uh, very old idea, but it, it's a very powerful idea in the West and it informs a lot of love stories. So that's um, the first part of this symposium. Uh, I, and then, the second part, he, there's this character Alcibiades who comes in and he's quite a rascal. And apparently he and Socrates have a thing going on. It's unclear how physical the thing is between these two men. It's cl clearly for the Greeks, there was a large homosexual aspect to love for many of them. Um, but Alcibiades seems to have this complaint that um, the thing he has with Socrates is mostly um, non-physical or people would say platonic. So if someone says, oh, are you dating this guy? 
and and then the girl says, "No, we're just platonic, right?" That means that it's not physical, but you kind of love each other's souls, or maybe he's like your super super good friend, or maybe he's your gay friend, or whatever you know. So the idea that it's platonic, a lot of people would take that to mean it's non-physical. Now, Alcibiades seems to think that Socrates is like the sirens and he casts a spell and he's quite enchanting, right? So if you, if you, I don't know if any of you noticed that, he said, I block my ears and run away as if escaping the sirens, right? So the sirens is from what? The Odyssey, right? So if you hadn't read the Odyssey and you hadn't read the parts we had just read the Odyssey, it, you wouldn't know what he was talking about here, right? You'd say, what do you mean sirens? It's like, you totally wouldn't get it. So um, that's why we kind of read all these works together so that they make sense. So what do you guys think? Can you think of anything that's really kind of plain on the outside and when you crack it open, it's all crystals? You ever see anything like that? Alcibiades is saying that Socrates is like a geo. The outside is all kind of gray and plain. It just looks like regular rock, but opened up to reveal the things he has inside. They're so divine, so glorious and gorgeous. Now that's what I always think of when I see a geo. It's always just so incredible. I, I have a thing for geos. I think they're quite pretty. Um, but it seems to me that they're saying that's kind of what Socrates is. And Plato is saying that that's what you need to love people for, right? What's on the inside? Because that's who they really are. That's the divine part of you. That's the, the godlike part of you. And that's the really beautiful part. Now, Alcibiades was like the best looking guy in Athens and he was super popular and super powerful. But um, Socrates didn't care about any of that. He just cared about the beauty of the soul. And Alcibiades is saying that Socrates himself had a, a beautiful soul. Um, so I think that's an important idea. And I also think one of the reasons that makes sense is that beauty fades with time. It just does, you know, not every woman is going to be, you know, 17 forever or whatever. We get older, we all get wrinkled, but our soul and our wisdom can increase and get more and more beautiful as we go along. So if you're choosing someone to spend your life with, how much better if someone admires you for the beauty of your soul, which will only grow over time, rather than if they just admire you for your physical beauty, which over time will go up and then it will start to go down, right? Um, you don't have to behave like the proverbial fool and experience something yourself before understanding it, okay? So I think that's important because today a lot of people say, oh, we need to have the lived experience of brown people or black people or queer people. They can only read books by queer authors about queer subjects or black authors about black subjects or brown or Asian or purple or green or whatever it is. And that, you know, they shouldn't have to read Shakespeare because Shakespeare is not black or, you know, it's not their lived experience. Plato is saying that these people are fools and people who think like that are foolish because the idea that you have to experience something yourself before understanding it is the definition of being foolish and limited. And one of the reasons we read the great books is it can help us understand about war and peace and all kinds of things that we'll never experience ourselves probably, but we can experience um, what the greatest people have thought about it. And therefore we don't necessarily have to go through all these experiences. Obviously, if you experience it, you'll understand it in a different way. There's nothing wrong with experience, but the idea that you, know, you can't read Moby Dick if you're not a sailor or something like that, it's just silly. Um, okay, so let's move to the Republic now. And that's Plato's most famous book. And I should just step back and say, if you could only know three people in the Western tradition, it's Homer, Plato, and Aristotle. If you know those three guys, you pretty much know almost everything that comes after. Almost everything that comes after Homer, Plato, and Aristotle comes from one of those three people. Um, uh, most literature comes from either the Iliad or the Odyssey, and most philosophy comes from either Plato or Aristotle. There's very, very little that's not in those three writers. Or if you want to break Homer in half and say Iliad, Odyssey, Plato, Aristotle, 90% of the stuff you're going to see uh, is, comes from them in one way or the other. Now, 
one of the most important things that Plato did was to distinguish sharply between appearance and reality. So he basically said, you may think you know stuff, but you don't. And you basically just see this world of illusion and sh uh, that he compared to shadows on a cave. And you need philosophers and philosophy to kind of teach you what's real. And um, we're gonna read tonight, we're gonna review tonight with the reading, which I think is a tough reading, probably one of the toughest we'll do uh, in this course uh, about the allegory of the cave. But before we do that, um, I would like to talk about the ring of Gyges, which I think is a much easier myth to understand, right? Now, before we read in Herodotus about Gyges, and he was the guy who thought his wife was so good looking that he wanted like his friend to see her naked and all this trouble developed because of that, right? Well, in this version of Ga the Gaiji story, he has a ring, which is a lot like the ring in what story? The Hub, right? So clearly Tolkien, you know, basically stole the whole idea from the ring of Gaijis, right? So he turns the ring and he finds he can become invisible. goes on, he says, uh, this, some would say, proves that no one voluntarily behaves justly, but only when compelled. And so this idea that if every, if, if you gave pretty much anyone this ring of Gaiji, people would use it to do bad things. And um, I guess the question that I would ask you guys is, how do you think you would really respond? A, how do you think, do you agree that most people would do bad things? And B, what do you think you would do realistically? It, you, it doesn't immediately occur to you like, oh, I want to go out and get a bunch of stuff. You're like, maybe I would do something different that I couldn't ordinarily do, right? Yeah. So the separate question is, what do you think most people would do? Do you, do you think he's right that most people would use the ring badly? I think that's a, it leads us in an interesting place. Um, there's something called the online disinhibition effect, which is this. That when people are online, since they don't really, people don't really know who they're talking to and people can kind of disguise themselves with an avatar or a fake picture or whatever, that because of that, people have all kinds of bad manners and bad behavior online that they wouldn't have in ordinary life, right? So the expression trolls or trolling someone or like that, um, people leave all kinds of nasty comments on YouTube, whether no one knows who they are, they have a fake screen name and stuff like that. Does that seem to you like sort of like the ring of Gaikis in a way? Because your true self is invisible online, right? You just have this personality. No one can really see who you really are. And so when people have that anonymity, when no one knows who they really are, pe people say that the studies show that people act much nastier when people, when they're kind of invisible like that, right? So to me, I'll just answer my own question. That suggests that maybe Glaucon, who's the speaker here, was onto something. That maybe when people are anonymous and invisible, they, they do kind of act in ways that are bad, right? But what is Socrates' response to this? You know, if you go online and you bully people, that's not the way to make yourself, you know, feel good because you're going to know that you did, you did ugly things and you're going to feel that you're ugly and you're going to be ugly in your own eyes and you're going to have to live with yourself, Right. As opposed to if you did the right thing, you can lay your head down at night and know that you are beautiful on the inside and are a good person, right? But I think that the answer there is very short. And in a way, I wouldn't say unsatisfactory, but we're kind of left wanting more. At least I was. I, I was left, after Glaucon had gone into all this detail, I kind of wish that Plato or Socrates had gone into more detail explaining why Glaucon was wrong because Glaucon gives a pretty powerful argument there. And as we've talked about with the internet and other things, you know, it, it, you can see how people probably would take advantage, right? Of being, being able to be invisible. Now let's go on to the allegory of the cave because um, I tried my best to make this make sense in a short way without, you know, going on and on and on because Plato goes into a lot of detail. I tried to shorten it and maybe in shortening it, it made it make less sense. Basically, yeah, he's saying, you ever seen like ducks in a shooting gallery and they're moving across and people are shooting at the ducks in the shooting gallery, right? You're, you're seeing that like in a cartoon or actually at a carnival, right? And you shoot the moving ducks. Well, Plato was saying that there's these people trapped in a cave 
and there's these like shooting ducks going by or like people going by, but then they're, they're being lit up from behind, kind of like a puppet show, right? And, but you, the people in the cave aren't actually seeing them. They're seeing the shadows being cast by light behind them. So they're not even facing these moving ducks, right? Or whatever, they're facing a wall. And so what they're seeing is the projection of the shadows of these moving ducks, right, on the wall. But they think that it's real because that's all they've ever seen. Does that make sense? But say, you ever done this like with your dog, like on a wall, like, hi, oh, here's my barking dog, right? And you see that shadow on the wall? Well, suppose that that's all you'd ever seen. You'd never seen a hand. You'd just seen that shadow on the wall, like the wall pup, the dog puppet, and a bunch of other shapes like that, like, you know, rabbit, blah, blah, blah. And your, he says, like, your necks are chained, so all you can't really move. So all you can see is these moving shadows on the wall. And then he says, what if someone breaks those chains, right, and kind of looks around the cave and then sees what's going on and sees that people only see the shadows. And then he comes out of the cave up toward this light and he escapes into like the real world. And then he sees like real people and not the shadows, but the actual stuff, right? And then he comes back down into the cave and he tries to tell people what's real. He tries to tell them, you've just been looking at, we've all been looking at shadows this whole time. And he says, the people would probably not believe this guy and they would probably kill him, right? Now, who does that remind you of that tried to tell people the truth and got killed? Socrates. So I believe this is an, an analogy or an allegory, which is like a symbolic story of what happened to Socrates. Socrates thought that everyone was just believing in fake stuff. He believed that he discovered what really was going on and what people should really believe. And he tried to tell everyone, but people couldn't accept it. And then he killed him. And since Plato was Socrates' student, it would make sense if, if that's what he, um, he believed. As for anyone who tried to free the prisoners and lead them upward, if they could somehow get their hands on him, might they not even kill him? Socrates asks. Glaucon says, I think they might. So then Socrates goes on and he says, we may compare the realm revealed through the sight and senses to the cave, right? So he says, all the things that we see in everyday life are really just like shadows on the wall. They're just kind of copies of the real thing, right? And the philosophy, the job of philosophy is to turn people from these shadows and this darkness to the light, okay? So then we move into uh, Plato's theory of education. So the whole idea of to educate the young is to turn them from the darkness to the light, turn their whole body around, turn the soul from the shadows on the wall until it can look at the brightest thing, which we call the good, okay? And he says that you have to turn them toward the good um, because otherwise, if they're turned toward the wicked, then their eyesight will work against them. And he says, um, the more sharply it sees, the more evil it does. He's talking about the eyesight of the wicked person, right? So it's super important that we set the right goals because if you set the wrong goals, you'll use all your skills and powers for bad ends. And you'll be like Satan or some supervillain, right? Like uh, who has all these powers, but doesn't use them for the right way. So the whole point of education is to steer you away from fake things or things that people, everyone else thinks is real, but he says is not real, right? Uh, he says, if we get rid of these, um, all these other distractions and turn the soul toward truly real things, um, then uh, we would compel the best natures to see the good. So now we get into Plato's idea of forcing people to, to do the right thing and see the right thing, be the right thing. And this is a big difference between Plato and other thinkers. Plato was probably the first defender of dictatorship and of kind of forcing people to do the right thing, even when they don't want to, for the common good. And one of the things he, he wants to force people to do philosophy, even when they don't want to, because he thinks, well, some people have to study philosophy and they had to have to lead the society, right? To bind the city together, all right? Now, that's a really important idea, the idea of political unity through a common philosophy, through common education. 
And the problem of political unity, especially in a democracy, right, where it's hard for people to all agree on everything, how are you going to get political unity? Everyone's got a different answer to that. Heraclitus said, oh, through the, at that which we all have in common, like reason or laws based on reason. Solon wanted to have political unity by kind of going slower and in a way that, you know, not everyone agreed was the ideal thing. So this, I, the problem of political unity is a big one. And there was a famous scene from the Iliad, which we didn't read, but where a character named Thersites right at the beginning is complaining that for so long, um, the Greeks have been fighting and everyone should go home. And this disrupts the political unity of the whole campaign over there in Troy. And Odysseus actually beats this guy Thersites down with the club to try to preserve the unity of the uh, Greek uh, expedition. It's the first incidence of cancel culture in Western tradition, I think. And um, in the, the case of Socrates, we see the Athenians trying to preserve political unity by canceling Socrates, killing Socrates. So Plato's answer is to use these philosopher kings to bind the city together, he says. But um, one of the things that this is very much like is the communist idea of a party which has special privileges, right? So in the communist society, basically you have these philosopher kings who are the pe members of the party and they get special privileges, but they're the ones who kind of have to go down into the cave and help all the ordinary people and quote unquote, enlighten them. And uh, I would say today, uh, United States uh, uh, teachers at a lot of these schools, these woke schools think that they're like the philosopher kings and they have to turn people away from their racism the opposite way to their anti-racism. And they really think that they're doing the Lord's work and they really think that that's what education is supposed to do, turn people from the darkness toward the light. And where that comes from in a, in a strong way, I really believe is, is played out in a certain way. You don't wanna have be a city like most nowadays full of men who form factions and fight each other over shadows. So that goes again to that idea of how to bind the city together, the problem of political unity people fighting over factions, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, right in the Federalist Papers, right? Hamilton's big thing was he was afraid of faction, right? Faction, faction, faction. The reason you need a federal government and couldn't just have the states is because of the problem of factions, people bickering and fighting over shadows, arguing over shadows on the wall instead of what they should really be concerned with, right? And so just the, we'll round it off the last the sentence for tonight, Socrates says, we cannot simply turn a soul from a night that seems a kind of day. Instead, we must lead the soul from the cave to the light, which we call true philosophy. So the idea of leading the soul from the cave to the light, and that being true philosophy, that's Plato's whole philosophy in one sentence, leading the soul from the cave to the light.